Evidence has shown us that there are four types of mummified animal from ancient Egypt. We have the cult animals, where there was only one of a specific animal alive at one time, which was held sacred by the Egyptian population. They lived very, very special lives. They were weighted on hand and foot, and when they died of natural causes, they were buried with enormous pomp and circumstance before a replacement was found. We also have pets, which were mummified by the ancient Egyptians to be taken with them to the next life. These are mainly buried in human tombs or nearby. We find food mummies which are buried in human tombs and their food offerings to be taken by that person into the next world. By far the largest group and the one that we have looked at here in Manchester are the votive offerings. And by votive offerings we mean an offering made by a person to give to a god to take a message. They're, they're a physical form of prayer. So these mummies were produced in their millions. We know of 31 animal cemeteries from ancient Egypt, which contain a variety of different species in huge numbers, ranging from cats, dogs, birds, fish, crocodiles, baboons. Many of them are still buried in situ in the archeological sites, but many more have been brought out of the catacombs. Lots of these mummies have found their way around the world by a variety of different means. The work that I'm doing at the moment is looking at the way that the British have been involved in the study of animal mummies from their discovery, their archaeological excavation, being brought over to Britain as souvenirs, as archaeological finds. Although our, re our research on animal mummies has been taking place at Manchester for the last 15 years, it was formally established as the Ancient Egyptian Animal Biobank Project in June of 2010. The aim of the biobank was to collate all this material into one centralised place. So we collect information on what the outside of the mummies look like, we take photographs, we record their appearance and their state of preservation. We use clinical radiography at Manchester Royal Children's Hospital to look at animal mummies from museum collections. So far, our work over the past 15 years has looked at around 800 animal mummies from about 57 museums. We use radiography because it's a non-invasive tool. It allows us to see inside wrapped animal mummies without damaging the outsides, as we need to protect the artifacts for the future. When we take mummies to the hospital, we do x-rays from two projections, so they always have an anterior, posterior, and a lateral image. Every mummy then has a CT scan, which gives us a three-dimensional image of the contents. And they can help to show us if there is an animal in there at all, whether it's the species that we're expecting to find or whether it's something entirely different. We use uh, radiography and CT to look at what's inside, how the, um, the core of the bundle, how that's been constructed. We also use CT to look at how the linen wrappings are being applied. Sometimes they're very tight, sometimes they're quite loose, and sometimes it looks as though they've been done in different stages. Using some of the data taken from CT scans, we've been able to use 3D printing technology to isolate specific examples, perhaps bones or other anomalies that we see on the scans, and we can physically replicate those to make it easier for visitors, for example, to this exhibition to understand what we're looking at. My research focus, as I've said, works with bird mummies. So bird mummies in the biobank represent about a third of all the animal mummies that we come across. Um, and they were buried in their millions in ancient Egypt. Um, why, did they, why did they mummify bird mummies? Well, birds were represented by certain gods in ancient Egypt. So the god Horus was represented by um, a type of small falcon. Um, we work in collaboration with the University of Bradford who have done some GCMS for us on some of our samples. So this is basically a chemical fingerprint of what was being used in the bird mummification. Um, my research is also focused on how the bird body was being treated directly. So for part of my PhD, I used like microscopy. So we're making use of the samples that the biobank has collated since 2010. Um, we have in excess of about 300 and they range from feather to linen, eggshell, uh, bits of reed and what we call mummy dust because it just looks like brown fluff that falls out of a, an animal mummy. 
So one of the things we do here um, as part of the BioRamp project is experimental mummification. And the main reason we do that is because there's very little written evidence. There's not a recipe for animal mummification um, that we've found yet. So the mummies remain our best source of evidence for how animals were mummified. In using clinical radiography to look at what's on the inside, we've been able to see how the embalmers were creating the mummy bundle. So we're now using the information we see in our radiographic investigation of the ancient examples to make our own mummies here in Manchester. One major um, advantage of looking at animal mummies is we can see how the climate has changed um, since ancient times. We know, looking at some of the species that we find mummified, that the environment was probably more green than it is today in Egypt. There would have been a little bit more natural water, there would have been more vegetation, and animals would have flocked to certain areas. Now these are the areas where we tend to see the animal catacombs today. Some of the animals we find mummified, such as the sacred ibis, are no longer present in Egypt today, because global warming pushed them further south into Ethiopia. So we can learn vital messages about what the environment was like and how it has changed over time.